Okay. Susanna, it's been over 15 years since your last solo album. Yeah. What took so long? Wow. I think that might be why I called it Someday, because um, it, well, the main thing that happened was that I reunited with the Bangles, and I, I had this sort of shoebox full of cassettes of things I've been working on. And we were talking about the Go-Go's earlier, you and I, and I had written a bunch of songs with Charlotte Caffey, and I ended up giving those songs to the Bangles when we've done, during the period since we regrouped, mm -hmm. we've done two records. The last one, Sweetheart of the Sun, came out in the fall. But um, I just kept backburnering it, you know, some, somewhere between juggling t being a mom and touring being a bangle and a mom and a wife and uh, you know just a person trying to get through the day i didn't find the time until i met this this young man who i just performed with today here uh andrew brazel who um sort of walked into my life friends with my niece and had that singular focus that you can have when you're 25 years old mm -hmm. and he sort of had a guitar glued to him and would just start singing in my living room and playing music all the time and I kept you know I'd be like in the kitchen washing dishes and I'd hear him playing and I don't know what it was about the stuff that he was just kind of riffing there nothing formal but I would just hear these melodies in my head and pretty soon I went running into the other room and s started singing along and we sort of thought let's try to write formally as opposed to just you know goofing around here and just experimenting. So we sat down and the first song we wrote was Picture Me. And it kind of just flowed from there. Did you have, uh, sort of in your mind, did you have a, a time carved out where you're like, one of these days I'm gonna get to that third solo album? I, I kept thinking that, I knew I wanted to do it. It was like this almost painful, like, <laughs> agony that I just I, I just was desperate to do it but life just kept intervening you know the the various school things and 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 bangles um, people still ask me are the bangles together it's just that we we tour all the time but we're quite under the radar we don't go out on those two-month bus tours like we did in the 80s because we all have kids so mm -hmm. we're all juggling um, but it, it actually was a big enough distraction from you know really sitting down and saying now's the time carving out the time but when Andrew and I started writing these songs they flowed out of us so quickly and then another interesting thing kind of chance meeting with Mitchell Froome sort of sealed the deal because we were out at Largo which is an incredible venue here in LA and um, we ran into Mitchell Froome and I just there was something in, he said that was a, a certain kind of excitement in my voice about this material. I introduced him to Andrew, and um, he said, I want to hear it. Oh, I want to hear it. But I thought it was that, oh, polite thing that people say, oh, I'd love to see pictures of your kid on your iPhone, or I'd love to hear your new songs, you know, that kind of thing. I didn't take it seriously. But then, like, two or three days later, my phone rang, and it was Mitchell, and so we didn't have any demos. We just walked into his house with two guitars, like folk style, and started playing the songs. And then I got another call from him two days later saying, let's make a record. Oh, that's it was like It was really thrilling. So then, then we were on, you know, then the green button was pressed and we were in full go mode. But it, was, it turned into kind of a, a great kind of challenge for Andrew and I to kind of come up with the last five songs. Cause, so we were very brill building about it. We would, we would work with Mitchell every day from 12 to 6. Very, very nice hours and we, we knocked out those last five songs. Brill building? Yeah, the Brill building was where all the great songwriters of the New York area mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would go, like Holland Dozier, Holland, that the teams of writers and Carol King and Jerry Goffin got started there writing for girl groups in the early 60s. The Brill building is probably still there, I don't know the address, but it was, it was like songwriter camp up there, but the, in, the, in the old days. So, Brazel, we call him Brazel. Andrew mm. Brazel and I would just sit around and uh, focus on crafting some songs right to order for the record. It was pretty cool. Were there echoes of these famous songwriters in your head? Oh, as yeah. I mean, for me, I always carry a torch for the 60s. I mean, we sort of jokingly say this is my love letter to the 60s, this album, and we kind of took it all the way. Mitchell listened to the songs, and he really... He's such a good producer. He's got such a great ear, and he kind of heard the 
sound of my voice and the amount of melody that we in, put into these songs and emotion. Actually, on the way here today, um, we were listening to si the 60s station on the satellite radio, mm. and I'm just always amazed at how emotional and melodic that music is. And I think that it's just a very special period of time when people weren't afraid to wear their heart on their sleeves. And I, that's when I grew up. That's when I fell in love with music. So I, I don't think you ever get over your first musical crush. I think, you know, it, it, that music was just unabashedly emotional. And that's kind of what I was going for with this. In your, in your choices for these songs, did parenthood, does parenthood change your perspective from? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think when you sit down and write, you're, you're telling your own story. And that was what was cool about writing with Brazel that, I'm sorry I keep going back and forth between calling him Andrew and Brazel, but I'll just switch to what I That's normally right. call him, which is Brazel. Um, he became such a fixture in our household. In fact, Jay had gone off to shoot Game Change and um, we had our guest room available, and he was the new kid in town, hoping to make a start in L.A., so he, he was staying in the guest room because he didn't have anywhere else to live. And so, um, you know, he was observing me, the mother, the person, you know, and, and kind of we would, we would have all that material. You know, the story of the day was sort of a starting point for writing the songs, and, and that's a great place to be. When I've, I've, I've noticed that happens when I've collaborated with people that you start out, you don't just hit the ground running with the, with the guitar, you sometimes kind of ease into the writing session just mm -hmm. talking about what happened that day and sure enough an idea, idea will come up. I mean Eternal Flame, I was just reminiscing about writing that with Billy Steinberg and Tom Kelly and it just started with me coming back from a Bengals tour and just saying, oh, wow, we went to Graceland. I finally got to go to Graceland, and on and on it went, and there was a story about the eternal flame at Graceland, and that turned into the song. Sure. Yeah. How does, how does your solo work differ from your Bangles work, especially oh. in the way you approach it and your, your sense of how the sound is different? Well, um, I think that one thing that I share with the Bangles is that love of the 60s music. That influence is really, really powerful with the Bangles too. In fact, that's probably why that's sort of the glue, the musical glue mm -hmm. for the group. Um, as far as what's different, I think in the Bangles um, we have kind of a sound that's structured around the three-part harmonies, three and four-part harmonies, and um, a little bit more of a, I mean, this album's very guitar driven, but there's kind of a, a sonic thing that we do. I play the Rickenbacker, it's jangly, um, it, it's based around two guitars, mm -hmm. bass and drums. On this record, I had the opportunity to kind of explore um, using other instrumentation that might not have been the obvious choice for the bangles, mm -hmm. you know. I got to uh, explore using horn section and, and strings and, I mean, the bangles have done that, but we got to really dive into that 1967 kind of orchestration that was popular then. Echoes of Bacharach. Yeah, big time. Intentionally? Very, very intentionally. I mean, that, that was one thing. I mean, you asked me, the first question you asked was, why so long a wait? Um, by the time I got there, by the time that the team was put together, Brazel, Mitchell Froome, and me, um, I was ready to do something that was very focused, very thought through. Um, and it, in fact, it, it was really the team that made that happen because when I first talked to Brazel about it, I literally had a box full of cassettes. And some were written in 1989, like the song Raining on my record. Um, that was started with Mike Campbell from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers back back that many years ago. And then there were some that I'd written with Charlotte Caffey and some that I'd written with the guys from uh, the Tuesday Night Music Club, mm -hmm. the, the band that, that first Sheryl Crow mm -hmm. album. Um, that's, those were the guys that I was writing um, November Sun with. So, um, you know, I, I was ready to kind of figure out how do I put all this stuff together? And so we really did go in with an, a kind of a formulated idea. Hmm. Looking back on 
you know, your, your rich Bengals history, which you're still with them. But, yeah. Uh, do you look back in the 80s and you look back at some of these videos and do you cringe? Do you cringe? Um, I do cringe quite a bit. And YouTube doesn't help because you cannot escape it. You cannot escape your past now, um, unfortunately, or maybe it's a good thing. You have to have a sense of humor about it. The fashion was in sometimes just dreadful. I, I don't know. I just saw an interview with the designer, um, Norma Kamali, talking about those, you know, five-inch high shoulder pads. Like, mm -hmm. we looked like we were wearing football jerseys. Who would have thunk it? But we all, you know, fell victim to that crazy fashion and statement. spending how much time working on your hair? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm so glad I don't have to inhale hairspray anymore. Um, but those were the days. And, you know, it, I look back fondly. On the way over here, I went from the 60s satellite station to the 80s one, and there was some good stuff in the 80s. But at the time, um, you know, I was trying to be very, we, the Bengals were trying to be as 60s-ish as possible, even though it was the 80s. Do you feel like you fit in retrospect in the 80s? Or do you think the music, how much of it do you think is timeless and how much do you think is kind of a snapshot of that decade? Um, a little bit of both, actually. I mean, I think Walk Like an Egyptian has sort of been turned into a bit of an 80s amp anthem now. And even at the time, it struck me as a rather quirky song. We were all completely confounded when that was picked as a single because as much as we thought it was a cool song we thought no one this doesn't sound like anything on the radio but that was always true a bit for the bangles um it, we, we we lived a little bit outside the box of what was going on in the 80s we weren't like that synthy sounding there was a heavy synth sound and there were these sort of i don't know these monumental drum sounds that I listen to now. It sounds like a cannon going mm. off. I, I'm always, it makes me smile though. And that's something. I, I, the 80s music makes me smile. There's something fun about it. Excellent. Um, I have a very E.T. question. Okay. You look phenomenal. Okay. For, uh, timeless yourself. For 53. Is, <laughs> for 53, which you're, you proudly state. And yes. I, how, Why not? What is your secret? Is there a secret? What is my secret? Okay. I think that I have fantastic parents and that I've inherited a youthful spirit and maybe some lucky, you know, oily skin from my father who's very olive like me. Um, my secret is I think I'm, I've always been into staying fit since I was a little girl and I was a ballet dancer, jazz dancer. Um, so I, I'm out there walking every day, rain or shine. I've been out there in my sweatpants and bubbles. I guess I didn't rinse my sweats out. I looked down once and it was pouring rain and bubbles from, from the laundry soap were bubbling. I was in the pouring rain. I will come home drenched. I, it doesn't matter. I walk rain or shine. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm a big fan of moisturizer. I always tell people, don't let your skin get dry. And that's about it, really. I learned that from Warren Beatty. Really? Warren, Warren Beatty, because, you know, for years and years, you look yeah. so young. You know. Yeah. He said one word, moisturizer. Well, I'm in that club, man. I and, and you know, it's it's easy to find. You can go to your local CVS, your local pharmacy, and get something inexpensive, <laughs> and it works. Final question: um, What's next for Susanna Hoffs? Love Sid and Susie. Oh, I hear you're working on a third yes, disc. Yes. Yes. Can I ask? what direction you're going, can you reveal much? I can't, I, I've sworn to Matthew that I'm gonna keep the secret of what the songs are until it comes out, because we did that with volume one, which was the 60s, and volume two, which was the 70s, or up to the 80s, which is interesting for me. Um, it is a, a really great collection of songs. I'm extremely excited about it, I'm about to start doing all my vocals, and that record is due to come out beginning of 2013. I have um, festivals with the Bangles coming up in Europe and Canada in August. And then Andrew Brazel and the team, the band, is going to go out on the road and do the solo uh, tour, which um, it, we play really intimate venues, which mm -hmm. I adore. I like that connection with the audience. It's really close. People can ask me questions, and it's very loose. Um, the set's going to be a combination of my own reworking of Bengals 
material so that I can do them any way I want because mm -hmm. the, the sisters aren't there to get mad at me if I do very bizarre versions of the songs. Um, not that they would, but um, I do a smattering of covers and then obviously the new stuff and some stuff from my other solo records. Hmm. Is there one particular Bangles tune that you really want to deconstruct? And oh, remark? well, the, the one that I was having a blast reconstructing, which actually was when I performed with Fred Armisen and Carrie Brownstein from Portlandia. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. that show. It's a really cool show. Um, they asked me to perform with them when they did their Portlandia live tour. And we were at Soundcheck, and we were doing Manic Monday, and we just randomly started jamming on it in this completely alternate version of it that had a bit of the Velvet Underground mixed with punk rock in it. And er, ever since I did that show those, show, those shows with them at the Echo Plex in January here in L.A., I've wanted to do a, a, a revision on that, a, like a revamping. So I did a manic medley at my last show, and it went into, it started out, well, actually, it started out, it was a crazy medley. It went into 1999 by Prince. Yeah. It went into many, many Velvet Underground songs and then came back around to Manic Monday. So oh, you never know. Phenomenal. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for coming to ET Thanks. Online to talk to us. Thank and you. And we wish you best with everything. To you, too. All right. Thank you. Cool. That was a really that fun was a great combo. Yeah, like